Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today uh, is the author of one of my favorite books of the last um, that I've read in the last couple of years, at least, um, Steve Anderson. Steve uh, is an expert in strategic risk and business growth, and the author of a book called The Bezos Letters. Uh, 14 Principles to Grow Your Business Like Amazon, uh, which has become a Wall Street Journal bestseller, USA Today, and international bestseller. Um, Steve helps business owners understand how to leverage um, the, the tension between risk, taking, and business growth. Uh, now, I was telling Steve this right before we started the interview. This is an awesome book. <laughs> so if you're a business owner, you need to buy it and you need to read it. I read a book a week, and this is one of my favorite books that I've read in the last couple of years. It's easy to read. It's concise. It's written well. Uh, and it's just interesting. I, I think, I've, I think within the first six months, I think I've read it twice, which I don't, I'm, I'm not, I was going to say, if you read that many books, you know, probably don't read a lot twice. So. I don't read a lot <laughs> twice. And, and I'm pretty sure it was with either within the first six months or nine months, I reread it because we were coming into an offsite um, with the company. I'm like, man, this is really good. And I want to I want to refocus on this. So really, really great book. Steve, great to have you here. Chandra, thank you. And um, as you know, as an author and any of those authors that might be listening, those are sweet words. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, Steve, um, so first off, let's start here. Why did you decide to write this book? I mean, for, it's, a, it's been a massive success, especially as a first time author. Why did you decide to write this book? Um, my background's in the insurance industry. Um, long story there, sold insurance kind of the first part of my career. The second part of my career, I really fell in love with technology and so helped primarily insurance agents and brokers use technology in their organizations. So kind of steeped in all the new stuff over the last 25 years. And a few years ago, I came up with this thought that the biggest risk business face is actually not taking enough risk. Oh, we, we see a lot of companies that were successful. Notice the past tense. Kodak, Blackberry, Blockbuster, Sears, Kmart. I mean, you, you could pick all kinds of different companies. And I started asking the question, why? You know, what happened? And started looking at all those companies I just mentioned and also those that had done it well. Well, certainly Amazon kind of came to the top pretty quickly. And was fascinated, what do they do differently? Um, came across the shareholder letters. So Amazon went public in May of 1997. Jeff Bezos, the CEO, wrote, has written a shareholder letter every year since. So 1997, now through actually 2020, the book goes through 2018. And I discovered that he had hidden in plain sight his plan for growing Amazon and found principles and realized that they could apply in some form or fashion to literally every type of business. Yeah. And, and so then you discover these principles, you decide, hey, I want to write this book about this. What about no, actually, it wasn't you... quite that simple. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. li literally, I, I had read them all. I was intrigued with them. I actually put together a one page executive summary for each of the letters hmm. into a PDF that I was going to give away as a lead gen. Right. Yeah. And Legion then for, I'm, I'm assuming your business for my, yeah, for my insurance technology consulting business, basically. Yeah. And um, fortunately, I'm married to a wonderful woman who ha has been in the publishing business for a very long time. And I told her about it. And she said, huh, that's not a legion. That's a book. So that's what started the, dare I say it, oh shit moment going a book are you kidding yeah. you know yeah. you do books i don't do books but um so that literally started probably an 18 month process of trying to figure okay what is the book how do yeah. we put it together and and getting it published it's so funny you mentioned that steve that that was my first uh, my my experience with my first book was and i think sometimes it can de-risk it because I, my, I was like, hey, this little PDF that I'll give away for free just to help people, that sort of thing. And so it almost de-risks it. And then that evolved into my first book. How did you make the leap from, all right, lead magnet to, to all right, I'm actually going to write a full book about this? 
Well, um, you know, honestly, the transition and, and Kieran works for a hybrid publisher now. And so actually the, the founder of that company, um, David Hancock, she talked to him about it. And he was like, oh, yeah, this is definitely a book. So I had lots of uh, encouragement to, OK, let's try and figure out what this might look like and how to do it. And yeah. lots of bumps along the way, by the yeah. way. So, you know, I, I, I guess even, you know, talking to other authors, it's um, how do I say it? You know, it it's hard and and it's worthwhile. And yeah. there were days where I was like, oh, my gosh, how, I can't do this. But yeah. um, fortunately, I had some good support. Yeah. And so, um, so, you, so you decide to write this book. It turns from kind of a lead magnet into a full book. Were there any thoughts or uh, so I'm curious if you went through this and then maybe advice for people who are going through this, if, if, whether you did or whether you're not. I think it would be easy to look at this topic and be like. A book about Jeff Bezos and Amazon already been done <laughs> you know there's the everything <clears throat> store great book there's i don't even know how many other books that was there ever that temptation to say oh yes up. like should i do this should i yeah and I, I mean i i certainly researched on amazon and other places okay what's out there certainly brad stone's the everything store great book but it was a history book mm, it yeah. wasn't so i felt like nobody had actually taken the time to look at the letters themselves mm. and figure out Wow. I mean, I really was shocked at how much Bezos talked about kind of their secret sauce at Amazon and, 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 and tools and how they thought about decision making, right? all kinds of stuff that we could talk about. And nobody had. Um, I mean, there were, I think, one or two books that had just reproduced the letters. Well, mm. that was sort of my first take on writing the, the draft. The manuscript was chapter one. 97 chapter 2 98 chapter 3 99 and that's what i first gave to karen to have her look at it and i still remember sitting down in the dining room she said honey I, we need to talk and i was like oh no what did i do right <laughs> and and she said nobody cares what letter what year can you pull out principles can you pull out themes mm -hmm. can you pull out ideas so that's Ooh. that's where the idea of the principles came from and yeah. then we were able to take that categorize the principles into four cycles and i think when people read the book it's it's a much easier way to grasp the principles and think about how can i apply them to what i'm doing that's great how do you land on that structure because i think i mean when you're thinking about doing this you could it, you could have just as easily written the history of Amazon through the Bezos letters, but I think it reads more like a self-help book that interweaves history in it. So how'd you land on that structure? Yeah, it, it's, um, well, I think a couple things. One, I felt like um, we had to address the issue in the book. I never worked at Amazon. What do I know, right? And, and that's where the positioning of being a risk expert who's saying you should take more risk became kind of the core concept that held stuff together. Meaning I call Jeff Bezos the master of risk because of how he uses risk strategically to grow, right? So counterintuitive to what most people think about from insurance and risk management uh, and then kind of start building. And, and I'm pretty good at research, you know, so finding the stories, listening to the interviews do, I mean, all of that kind of stuff actually was really fun for me to do. So let's talk about that, the research phase. How do you, how do you balance, I mean, the, the, the desire to research and the interesting part of research with writing the book? What did your process look like? I think one of the most dangerous things for a lot of authors that we work with is there's two sides of the spectrum. Either I research for five years, 15 years and never write anything, or I just skip past the research and just start writing. And then it's messy and it's not, there's not a through line. how do you balance the research and the writing? Well, if you know anything about the Enneagram, I'm a five, which okay. is the yeah. researcher. So mm -hmm. I actually had to fight against the research for five years. Um, and, and it became easier because then the research, research became can you find a story about this? Or I need something else that explains this principle. So then I could dive in and do the research, but not 
um, not get so buried. And frankly, we were on a deadline. <laughs> you know, we had an agreement, we had a pub date, we didn't have a manuscript. I mean, and so there was just a lot of, um, I would say pressure, right, to get something done. And, yeah. uh, and we did, you know, it, and it, and um, what's the right phrase I want to use? Much to my surprise, you know, and, and again, Chandler, you know, this just from book strategy, it certainly didn't hurt to have Amazon and Bezos on the cover. Yeah. Right. You know, just that. And, and the cover is just so intriguing yes. to me. Um, yeah. And actually I'll tell cover. you insider, you, you and all your friends, uh, I use 99 designs to do the book cover. No way. I didn't like any of them that my publisher put together. Yeah. And so I put a contest out there, narrowed it, had about 60 some submissions, narrowed it down to about five or six, put it out on social to vote. Right. And, uh, and by far, this was the, the, the be be biggest voting and it, it, people talk about the cover all the time. Yeah. Oh, it's a great cover. Now, two, I was going to ask about this later, but I'll just go and ask now two specific questions on the cover. One was, is it the back of Bezos's head? Cause you would no. have had to have. It's, it's an not... Adobe photo stock. Got it. And would but you it have certainly had to looks like it doesn't it? <laughs> Bezos's face on the cover. Well, you know, that's really interesting because we even had that question with, we yeah. reproduced in the book, right. the full 1997 letter mm -hmm. and the full 2018 letter. Right. And, you know, we, we talked a lot about, did some legal research about copyright of those yeah. letters. Well, they're SEC filings, right? So does that put them in the public domain? Probably not, but they're published all over. And in fact, as I mentioned, there are a couple of books, at least two or three now, and probably one or two when ours was published that literally just republished every letter on the Amazon site available for sale. So mm -hmm. I felt pretty comfortable. One, we could have a case, but Bezos has a lot more money than we do. So <laughs> didn't want to go down that route. And yeah. two, the flexibility of the publisher, we could have pulled those letters out of the print copy if we mm. needed to. And there's sense. never been a hint of a question on, on e either of those. That's great. And, and on the same note of the cover, um, did you have to get uh, approval or is this public domain nope. or just um, to do it's this? It's not him. The Amazon swoop? Well, and the, I, no, I'm like and, the, and the Amazon. No, the swoop is actually not exactly like theirs. Got it. So that's another question, again, that lots of people use it um, in some form or fashion, but we were careful enough to not just copy it directly. It. So Got it's it. a, there are, subtle changes everybody knows what it is but yeah, um yeah. and it's it's not part of the amazon logo right, right. it's it's a separate um yes. item or component to it got it and guys if you're curious uh go find the book on amazon and maybe you'll know <laughs> what we're talking about with this cover um i want to go back to the research piece steve um so if you were to give a pie chart of your research, right? A bit pie chart of equaling 100% of the research, what percentage of that pie chart was done prior to starting the writing of the book? And what percent of that pie chart happened kind of throughout the writing process? So the, I would say probably, um, I don't know, guessing now, 20% 20, 20 prior. Okay. So that was sort of putting the, mm. putting the executive summary together for the, for the PDF, you know, the ebook. Yeah. And then we had the structure there already because I had pointed out different things that he had talked about. Then it was filling in the stories, right? So stories carry a book, you know, just listing principles and draw, talking dry. Again, I think your experience and others that, that I've talked to is how well the book pulls the reader through, meaning open loop, I mean, if you want to get technical, right, opening loops, not closing them for some period of time, having interesting stories, both personal stories uh, of mine, plus stories of Bezos and others that have talked about their experience at, uh, at Amazon. Mm, that's great. And that's a great distinction, Steve. And, and, uh, and so 
can you talk about how you could, because it's so funny. I mean, even with, with my books or with my talks, even, I feel like certain people have different natural tendencies, right? And, and maybe you're similar, maybe you're not. For me, it's like, all right, I want, like, I can teach and I'm going to teach all the things. And what I've found is I need to get way better at strategically uh, weaving stories to make it compelling right. um, and, and that sort of thing. So it sounds like the structure was, all right, we've got the kind of the four overarching principles. We've got the chapter structure, that sort of thing. Now we've found stories to integrate, to weave it all together. Was that the structure? And then how did you just, how did you decide or find the stories that kind of weave together the narrative? So a couple of quick comments. One is when Karen and I had that talk, that I had done everything chronologically. And she said, that's boring, nobody cares. Can you go back? She asked me, can you go and find principles? Well, I, literally the next day after, I was crestfallen by the way, <laughs> right? I'd spent all this time writing and trying to put stuff together. Um, I, I immediately had eight principles. We decided to expand that to 14, partly because Amazon has 14 leadership principles. They uh -huh. now have 16, they've added two, but mm -hmm. at the time they had 14. So we sort of mirrored that, but these were growth principles, not leadership principles. Um, and then it was, um, again, interestingly, I thought I had lots of stories in there and Karen was like, ah, no, we need you know, more of this, more of that, more of this. So then it was kind of going back, research or finding interviews where, he, where Bezos talks about his stories, like um, ev everything I wrote about Bezos growing up, spending his summers at his grandfather's ranch in West Texas, all of that are things that he get talked about in interviews. So I was able to take that, uh, weave those into mm -hmm. how, to, you know, really trying to answer the question, how does he, how did he start thinking this way? And I think there's a lot in his background that has led him to um, the mindset that he has. Mm, that's good. I want I want a couple more things about writing, then we can get into to book sales and, and a lot of the other stuff. Um, obviously, you have the advantage, and I think um, but the elephant in the room that we haven't totally talked about, but I think most people know, is that obviously your your wife Karen helped with writing the book. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, so and I mean that's a big, and frankly, big that's part. why her name's on the book. Originally, yeah. we weren't going to do that, and I was like. No, I mean, you, you were responsible for making the book readable and yeah. uh, she deserved it. She worked for yeah. it. She earned it, not even deserved sure. it. She earned it to yeah. have her as a, as a, um, a with, as you know. So, yeah. And so I, I think there's an advantage there because obviously acquisitions editor, Morgan James, um, she's, she's seen a lot of books. She's worked with a lot of books, um, that sort of thing. Um, so <sighs> Can you talk to me about, because uh, uh, the punchline is intentionality with your research, right? And that there's a phrase that you said that I thought was a great distinction was that, oh, I could, I could go out and find a story or find something to illustrate a point. And I think a lot of people, when they think research, they think, let me just learn anything I know on this topic, but how you did some intentional research that formed your hypothesis or the structure of the book. And then there was intentional research either after or during the writing to make the writing more effective. How, how did you, how, what did that process look like and how were you intentional with your research kind of throughout the writing piece? Um, huh, I'm not quite sure how to answer that because it's just part of who I am. I mean, I, I, I mean, that's part of why I like technology is I love learning. And kind of you, you mentioned earlier, I, I think at a heart, I'm a teacher. So I kind of had, like you, had to take, I want to teach you this to hear some stories to illustrate or help you remember. Because again, people remember stories, they don't remember facts. And, you know, that, that has become a part of how I operate today. Um, but you're right, I, it was, you know, at, during the process was, we need more stories on this topic or this area, you know go find them. And it was like, you know, um, a, a treasure hunt, I guess, maybe yeah. is how I would say it to, to find yeah. those stories and, and weave them in and again, make it interesting. Um, yeah, and that when I think the, the important takeaway there for folks is because I think the, the thing that I'm, um, I'm trying to make sure that we speak to is I think a lot of people, when they think about researching for a book, 
their pie chart would be like 90% before I start mm. and 10% after I've started. And I think what you do intuitively, it's like the unconscious competence. <laughs> it's like the thing that you do well, that, that is, you do it so well that you don't even realize you do it well. And just from, from speaking through this, and it sounds like you and Karen both did this well, is that there was research spread throughout, but not to slow down the writing process because you had a deadline, but to make the book better. And so right. then you're, you're more intentional and you're more effective with all the research that you're doing throughout the, the right. project. Well, and I, I, I mean, early on when we first started talking about it, I, I said to Karen, I, I said, the only thing I ask is don't let me have a crappy book. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and we don't. So that, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I took me a Mission while to say that, but I've got enough feedback now that I, it's a good book. Yeah. It's a good book. I agree. Hey, common question we get asked on this topic, Steve, is what am I allowed to say? What am I not allowed to say, especially when writing about a topic, you know, a company or, or, you know, something like Amazon or Jeff Bezos. I know this is not legal advice and disclaimer, 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 right? right? I'm um, not an attorney and I don't play yeah. one on TV. <laughs> but what was, did you have some general overarching kind of principles or what counsel did you get with like, oh, you can say this, don't say this or association stuff like well, that? Well, and I would say most I'm trying to think a lot. I'll say in the book, I'm quoting from other sources. And, and for me, a key there was uh, footnoting. And, and we did it in the back of the book, right? Not at the bottom, but, but having the references for where I'm quoting from, because I was very concerned about, because I was using so many other people's interviews or YouTube or, uh, presentations that Bezos made, et cetera, I wanted to make sure to give due credit everywhere. In fact, I probably overdid it some, but that's a much better place for me to be than uh, being accused of plagiarizing something, yeah. calling it my own when it's not. Yeah. And when as a, as a risk guy. And in terms uh, of what can... to say or not to say, if yeah. it's personal opinion or personal, re here's what I think, or here's, you know, I, I that's, I'm trying, I don't, I can't remember of a question we had in the writing process kind of along those lines in mm. terms of like, yeah. I think for me, the, the position was making sure I footnoted if I got that information from another source. Got it. Was there anything that your publisher or editor came back with and said, hey, we can't say that? Like, no. We don't that. Actually, well, we, I, I think we might get into this in a minute. Uh, um, the, um, oh, I'm trying to think how to st start this. Um, we had pushback from one of our foreign rights publishers and they ended up removing the 1997 and the 2018 letter from their edition mm -hmm. of the book because they were concerned about copyright. Yeah, that makes sense. And that was a big international publisher that actually, yeah purchased rights um, for a particular country. Right. That makes sense. But that was really the only time we had a, a pushback or a question on that. Got it. It's shifting into the launch phase. How did you launch this book so well, Steve? And, and what were maybe two or three things you did to really be intentional around the launch of the book itself? Well, I, I think a couple things is um, because Karen's been around the book publishing business, she understands better than most that the author sells books, not the publisher. Publisher provides distribution, but as an author, if you're not going into this thinking, I am the marketer, if you're thinking your publisher's going to do it, that's a problem because that doesn't work. From traditional to hybrid to self to whatever, whatever model you choose is best for you. So I think that for second is we invested money. Um, we had a publicist um, that, um, and again, we can talk about whether that was worth it or not, but paid you know pretty good money over trying to think maybe a six month period. Um, got on some, some national exposure, um, did a couple uh, TV shoots in New York City. Uh, which certainly helped. Was it worth it or not? I don't know. <laughs> that was really hard to, to put a number to. But social media, um, we, we had a team of people that we brought around us to help us 
get the word out and keep it out. Um, and that included um, early on, I, I don't now, but early on a podcast, what's the right word, promoter or, yeah. you know, hooking up guests with podcasts. Um, right. That actually, I, I would say for me, podcasts continue to be one of the most effective ways to keep the word of the book going. Mm. And, and frankly, that that's my goal for 2020 was on stage keynote speaking. Mm. Huh. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> yep. So I still did a few. They were, you know, all virtual. Um, fortunately, I was booked in quite a few places. Fortunately, didn't have to give any money back. Mm -hmm. But um, my goal for 21 is to keep the book alive. Yeah. And so I have found podcasts to be a great way to do that. Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, and, and um, I have a pretty big LinkedIn presence too. So yeah. that certainly helps. I have a newsletter I do on LinkedIn and mm -hmm. some of those. So I would say a number of those things, but just being consistent with it. Hmm. Um, a couple of follow-up questions there. How um, was a publicist worth it? I know a lot of people are, some people are like, hey, total waste of money. Some people are like, hey, best money I've ever spent. And it can, it can kind of live or die on one massive appearance as to whether it's worth it. Or what was your take? Um, I'm not sure I'd do it again, but I don't regret doing it. Or I may ask a lot more questions before doing it again. So I, I'm, I'm in that middle ground. Um, I, certainly it... And frankly, even from the book website, having some of those studio Fox News extra pictures, yeah. Yeah. I, I, how do you put a, a, a price tag on that? Or when a podcast host goes to the web, you know, comes yeah. across the book and goes, sees that, oh, I guess Steve's got some experience. Yeah. Um, also hired a media coach. Uh, I'm trying to think now. Hired a media coach. Okay, how do you, how do you take hmm. questions? How do you answer them? How do you do you know, 60,000 words in four minutes or less. Cause if you're on a yeah. TV, that's, that's a lot of time. Um, so, so how do you narrow those kinds of things down and still get done? I mean, still promote the book, right. Yeah. And, yeah. and keep it out there. It was a valuable and interesting interview, but that leads to books. Yes. It always books. needs to lead to exactly. What so was, by the way, for that, we yeah. created an assessment um, yep. that we pointed to in the book and on the website. So mm -hmm. we had the lead gen built in Smart. at the end of every chapter. If you notice, there were questions and then for more information yep. and those kinds of things. We knew enough marketing to uh, have those hooks in, yeah. uh, in the book. That's great. Um, Steve, what were, uh, what were, if you remember, one or two things that, that were most helpful from that media coach that you learned that changed the way that you do, um, that you do or that you did um, interviews for TV and that sort of thing? Hmm. Um, well, one, completely reformatted my website. So if you go to my media page on uh, thebezosletters.com, that actually is very strategic and one, how it's laid out, what's there, what the verbiage is. And it was all, um, I'm thinking of, so I had, I had kind of two coaches. The second one uh, was somebody who produced Oprah's TV show for like 10 years, 12 years. <laughs> and so how to pitch. Yeah. So oh, I learned from her how to pitch and, you know, again, what to say, what not to say um and bios so i have three different length of bios so what goes yeah. in your bio and yeah. I, a lot of subtle stuff yep but as she honed in you know really pounded into me when a producer who only has a minute or less this is what they're looking for and so kind of honing mm. how you present information to catch mm. a producer's eye basically mm. Anything um, that would be helpful for folks that was on kind of that what to say, what what not to say list when pitching the media? Um, it's about them and their audience, not about you and your book. It's not about what you want. What is it? Amen. What is it that, how can your book help 
them. And part of that is, again, having links to podcasts so they can hear that you can put two sentences together, mm. having video of presentation. And again, I'm mixing here a little bit. That's more the pitching side, but certainly for the keynote speaking side, right? The whole, a whole other area. I think probably that's what I've learned most the last couple of years. Every segment or piece has its own um, what to do, what not to do, or how to do it. Mm. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's been, I, I'm much better today than I was when I started. I will say yeah. that. Yeah, that's great. And kind of localizing it to the audience, the show. To the audience, yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah, so yep. it's beneficial for them. And that makes the, the person interviewing you or the person who books you look good. <laughs> Um, right, which exactly I, I, and, and achieves their objectives, which I think even just a micro thing right before we started this interview, it's like, hey, let's like, let's make sure what would be most helpful to chat about. Right. Small thing, um, but it really makes sure that this is as, value, as valuable as possible for the audience, which I think is a is a key distinction. Hey, we're, we're in the home stretch here, Steve. I've got a bajillion other questions that I could ask, <laughs> uh, but only time for a few more. So um, I guess on the book sales piece, we've talked about some of the things that work really well and some of the things that, that sold books and, you know, TV being an authority builder, not necessarily a book seller, but right. accelerating a lot of the other stuff. Podcast interviews, it seems like it worked well. Globally, why do you think this book's taken off and sold so well? I, I think there... Um, I think there's a lot of interest in how did Amazon do what they do, right? How, how did they get there? What, again, secret sauce, right? What is it about Amazon that's so different from every other company? Um, and I think there's lots of things there. Uh, we were surprised really early on. In fact, even before the manuscript was done, we were getting interest from Asian countries about the book. Um, um, we, the publisher has a foreign rights editor. That's all they do is foreign rights. And she kept asking, give me a PDF. I don't care. I just need something, right, um, to, to get that. And, and we were fortunate in that that first foreign rights sale was an auction between five different publishers in Korea, South Korea. And the winning bid was twice as big as any other foreign right offer that pu the publisher had ever received. No way. So that was our first indication that, huh, maybe there's something more here than we realize. Yeah. And it's gone on. It's it's uh, being translated into 18 languages. Wow. And so that's great. I mean, that'll be a great place to wrap up. I got a couple questions on that. I international rights, writing the book in different languages. I, I, was, so, I was going to ask, how'd you decide to, to pursue this and which countries to pursue? Well, it sounds like people were beating down their door. People were beating, <laughs> people were asking for, yeah. Um, and, you know, um, there are foreign rights agents. Uh, a lot of times that's not talked about in the self-publishing world as much because it's a little harder to get to because they typically work with either traditional or hybrid publishers. So I don't have any particular insights on how to get one or find one. And I mean, they kept coming to us. Do we agree to this? Um, and we split that with our publisher. Um, I, I don't know. I haven't done the numbers. I don't know if I can say this, but we made a lot of money just from foreign rights. So foreign rights wow. basically... Are, are more of a traditional publishing model in that you get an advance. And it is against book sales and maybe we'll get some more. I'm not counting on it. Um, but we've also seen um, in Japan, in the largest bookstore in um, Tokyo, somebody sent us a picture of a big, I would say billboard. It's a screen yeah. outside the bookstore with our yeah. book on it. Wow. in the Japanese edition. So yeah. one of the weirdest things ever to do is see your book in another language. That's, that's wild. And fortunately, I mean, we didn't have anything to do with that. They translated it. They, yeah. and in fact, they can choose to use the same cover or not. Um, so I don't know if, I don't know if we can see, but on the back wall there, mm -hmm. all of those frames are different mm -hmm. book covers uh, yeah. from foreign editions. So that's interesting. So it sounds like 
uh, and just just to kind of recap for folks, so you, you got foreign right agents. A lot of these approach you. Is it is it one agent that you're working with, or it, does each country? So my publisher have... works with one agent. Got it. Uh, and they have sub agents in various countries around the world that they know of. So that's kind of like that network, right? Yeah. That's the network they built up. That's the value they bring got because it. of those relationships that they've developed. That you know, I would never have access to. Yeah. And so it sounds like typically you would be, if I was trying to do this as a self-published author, or even traditionally published author, which obviously it's harder because I've got to have a, a critical mass of, of book sales for this to justify that. But just say, let's just assume that I do. Um, then I'm going to be working with multiple agents and those agents might represent one country or, or a series of countries. So our agent is the only one we worked with directly they have relationship with the agents in various countries who know, who are, you know, they're, um, what's the right word? The agent in Turkey or Greece yeah. or Italy yeah. or, right. And they work with and know the publishers there. So there's a couple layers there, which means you split commission a couple of ways, oh, but something's better than nothing. <laughs> and so you looked at it as, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to make a decent amount of money on all these advances. And if I just make that, that's good. That's money that I wouldn't have other had. I would have otherwise had, and that's additional book sales. That's a, you know, there's, it's well it's and additional exposure business. and, yeah. you know, somebody reads the book and wants to hear me speak. Got Perfect. It. Yeah. Now, again, last couple of years have kind of put a damper on that, but uh, that, that was, that is, was, and is the idea of gaining ex exposure and all of that adds credibility to the book so if you or somebody else is looking at you know do i pick this book up be it on amazon or someplace else and they see other languages they were like there's a credibility that's given yeah to that Mm, that's interesting. Did you how how did you decide on which countries to to sell the rights into? Was it just kind of hey, if it's above X monetary threshold? I, frankly, I um, early on it was more kind of the larger dollar amounts, but the smaller the country, the lower they're willing to pay because again they're yeah. taking the risk on and and all the costs right of translating and publishing and all of those kinds of things. So. It got to the point where something is better than nothing, even if it's not a lot. Mm, that makes sense. Man, there's, there's, there's so much to unpack here, Steve. This has been great. Uh, knowing, uh, knowing what you know now, Steve, kind of final question that I have, what would be your advice to uh, the Steve from, uh, from years ago prior to writing this book and all the other Steves out there that are thinking about writing a book or their first book, especially? Um. Well, I, I think a couple of things. A book is, is an amazing tool to, that allows anybody to gain authority. I mean, they're an expert. I'm not, I don't consider myself an expert on Amazon, but I'm pretty, pretty good at the letters and what's in there and, and those kinds of things. And from a, so from a business perspective, it's, it is a great tool having a book. Um, I, I, I have gotten the question, um, you know, did you like writing? No. Um, and I've, I've written my whole career. So, so that, that I understand as a mechanism for building an audience. But there's a huge difference between a thousand word article and a 60,000 word book. Um, and the way I phrase it is, I love having written a book. I'm not sure, I, you know, I keep getting asked, is there another one? And, <laughs> and I don't know. Uh, keep now I know one. what's involved. Yeah. One, it would be easier on one hand. And two, I know the work required. Yeah. And, and I guess what I would say, too, and I want to make sure people hear this. You sh I have seen some people publish, some experts, some people with authority publish books that were terrible. And, and, it, and, and frankly, it lowered their, my view of them. So if you think you want to have a book, it's a great tool. Do the absolute best job that you can 
and give away. Don't think, oh, I, I have to save this for the back end. You know, yeah. give away, make it the best book you possibly can. That will go much farther helping you uh, accomplish what you want to accomplish. I agree. That, that's great advice, Stephen. Honestly, if I were you, I'd keep marketing this book like crazy because I think it's such <laughs> well, a I think it has some legs. Frankly. Oh, it does. And it's just going to keep, I think, snowballing. And it's it's what a lot of authors that have come on this podcast talk about is it's the it's the five year launch. Yeah. Which you know, so many people move on after launch week, but just when you have a book this good that's already getting such significant early traction. I mean, it's cool. This has got to be a cool moment, Steve. I, it I is. Uh, Amazon and, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm prepping for the interview. I'm going through the author bio and, uh, your Amazon page and all that. And it's like, people also bought Walter Isaacson, right. Which is one of my favorite, uh, authors, you know, yes. writing on Steve jobs and Elon Musk and, um, and all these people. And so, uh, that's gotta be, that's, this had to have been a cool experience, but Steve, this has been so great, man. Uh, where can people go, uh, to, to buy the book? to learn more about you uh, and what you're up to and all that good stuff. So uh, the book is available in any bookstore, uh, certainly on Amazon. Um, uh, if, if you can't find it in your local bookstore, um, the book website is the Bezos letters.com. And again, there's some additional information there, a little workbook to help you work through the principles and how they can apply in your own situation, um, get maximum benefit out of it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Steve, thank you. And guys, this, uh, it's a great book. So if you're a business owner, if you're, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or even leader, um, gosh, I mean, there's so many of the use cases, product manager, <laughs> uh, marketer. I mean, it, it's a really great book and I highly recommend it. Uh, and Steve's not paying me to say that. I just love the book. Uh, and I, I think you should read it. So Steve, thank you so much. Chandler, my pleasure. Great talking with you. Take care.